Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word is the truth, and we do receive it written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. Thank you for all that you're bringing forth, and we will be hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. On Sunday morning, we began to talk to you about the subject of overcoming compromise, that we're to never compromise the word of God. And on Sunday evening, we talked about those who obeyed the word of God without compromise and saw God bring forth the things that he purposed in their life. Tonight, we're going to talk about those who did not compromise in the midst of pressure. God does not want you to compromise in the midst of anything that the enemy would bring against you, any kind of pressure in any situation. He wants you to do the word. He wants you to trust in him, walk in his ways, and know that he will enable you to prevail against your enemies. We begin here in 1 Kings chapter 18. This is the time when the Israelites had rebelled against God and they were worshiping Baal. And as they were worshiping Baal, curses would come upon them and there was famine in the land. But God had an answer though, of course, was to confront the evil, the false worship. And that's what he wants you to do, confront what the devil might be doing in your life is you've got to come against him. You can't just put up with what he's doing. 1 Kings 18, verse 1, It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. There was a time of famine. No rain was coming on the earth at that time. So in verse 17, it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah as he came to him. But Ahab said unto him, Are thou he that troubleth Israel? Ahab, of course, was worshiping Baal, married Jezebel, totally rebellious to God's ways whatsoever. And so what's he do? He says, You're the one who's troubling Israel. No, that's not the truth whatsoever. He answered and said, I've not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you followed Balaam. Or this is talking about Baal. You followed this false god. He'd forsaken the commandments of the Lord, was not walking in the ways of the Lord any longer. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel into Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Bring them all, we're going to have a meeting. And he's ready to confront them all that were caused all the problems that were going on in Israel. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. Elijah came unto all the people. Now he's addressing these people that had rebelled. Now they were worshiping Baal. He said, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word, because they were already following Baal, and they, they didn't have anything to say to his comment. Well, then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks. Let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces, lay it on wood, put no fire under. I'll dress the other bullock, lay it on wood, put no fire under. And call ye upon the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Well, all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Why would they be liking that? Because the representative and the manifestation of their false gods, they believed was one of the ways was by fire. They believed he was, would manifest himself in some way with fire. So, oh yeah, someone who shows up with fire, that'll be the true and living God. So, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose your bullock, dress it. And call on the name of your gods, put no fire under. So they do this very thing. And then they begin to call out to him, O Baal, hear us. There was no voice, nor any that answered. They leaped upon the altar that was made. It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he's a god. Either he's talking or he's pursuing or he's in a journey or bird venture he sleepeth, must be awakened, mocking him. They cried aloud, cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. Came to pass, midday was past. They prophesied till the time of the offering, the evening sacrifice. All day long they're trying to get him to respond. 
Neither was there voice, nor any, any to answer, nor any that regarded. Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. He took the twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, upon whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, made a trench about the altar as great as wood contained two measures of seed. He put the wood in order, cut the bullock in pieces, laid them on the wood, he said, fill four barrels with water, pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. This isn't going to be any fluke. We're going to drench this thing. Do it a second time. They did it a second time. Do it a third time. They did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar and filled the trench also with water. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near. He said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, that I am thy servant, that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. He confronted them, dealt with it, saw God manifest himself, and it turned the tide. And then, of course, the rain came as God brought forth the rain. No longer would he hold the famine against him. A name contest to prove who was the true and living God. You must have confidence in the name of the Lord. When you call on the name of the Lord, the name through faith in the name will bring healing, it'll bring deliverance, it'll bring promises. He will respond as you pray the word of God. He confronted these ones and proved who the true and living God is. You need to see God be working in your life. You need to prove Him manifesting Himself, getting you delivered, getting you healed, getting you set free from bondages as you act upon the word. And you need to confront everything that is of the enemy, including being ready to confront those that are believing lies and to prove the true and living God. God wants us to be ready to deal with situations and not back off and don't have any compromise in the midst of any kind of pressure or situation that might arise against you. We see another case involving Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. The king of Syria warred against Israel, took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. Well, the man of God said unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for hither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place the man of God told him and warned him of, saved him there, not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? God was revealing things, see, to the prophet. One of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet of Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. He will lead you and guide you. He will show you things to come. He will reveal the plans of the enemy. He will always show you what to do if you will seek after him and listen to him. So the enemy will not be able to prevail against you. He said, Go and spy where he is that I may send and fetch him. It was told, saying, Behold, he's in Dothan. Therefore sent the thither horses, chariots, great hosts. They came by night and compassed the city about. Well, he already knew what you were doing, saying in your bedchamber. You think he doesn't know what you're doing now, moving about, coming after him? Servant of the man of God was risen early, gone forth. Behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. Servant said unto him, Alas, my mother, how shall we do? What are we going to do now? They are all coming after us. He answered, Fear not. Doesn't matter how many enemies come at you, do not get in fear, regardless of what situation shows up. You cannot get in fear, or you're going to compromise the Word of God and give place to them. Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You got to know who's available to fight the battles. The angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for us, the heirs of salvation, and you can put them in operation. Jesus said, I could have prayed to the Father and he'd have given me 12 legions of angels to deal with the situation. 
You can pray to the Father and he'll give all the angels necessary for you to deal with any situation that you might come in contact with. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. That's all the angels ready to attack, ready to destroy all of the enemies. When they come down to him, Elisha prayed and the Lord said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. He smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. And that finished them all off. They got stopped. You and I have authority and dominion over all the power of the enemy. You can speak the word of God against the enemies. You can release God's power. You can command the work of his hands to destroy every work of the enemy. It might be arrayed against you. It doesn't matter what's coming at you. God will lead you. The Holy Spirit will show you what the enemy's up to. And you are, when the enemy does try to come at you, you know, he comes out with a flood. What's it say? The Spirit of the Lord will rise up, and with a standard, he'll dry, strike, drive against him. He'll come against him and drive him out as you put him in operation. In this case, he finished them off by bringing blindness upon them, which stopped all of their works. We see a scripture over in Second Chronicles involving Jehoshaphat in chapter 20. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. There came some, then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There comes a great multitude against thee. You might be having some situation where it seemed like all, all the enemies are just coming against me from every direction. It doesn't matter how many enemies are coming against you. It doesn't matter what the situation is. You are not going to compromise for anything or draw back or be afraid or be moved by anything. And so a great multitude comes against him, but beyond the sea from the side of Syria, behold, they be in Hazazan uh, Haz, Tamar, which is in Gedi. So Jehoshaphat feared, this is not being afraid, this is talking about the fear of the Lord, and set himself to seek the Lord. What do you do when anything is coming at you? Seek the Lord, get the counsel of God, Find out what he wants you to do. Get to his word. Listen to the Holy Spirit's leading and guiding of showing you what to do in every situation. He proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So they gathered themselves together. They were asking help of the Lord. And they were seeking the Lord. They stood in the congregation there. And they began to pray. Verse 6, O Lord God of our fathers, art thou not God in heaven? Rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen, and thy hand is there not power and might, so is none able to withstand thee. That's what their status was in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, he set you over the kingdoms and over all the nations and over all the devils. You have authority and power over all the enemies. There's no enemy that will be able to stand against the power of God when you put it in operation. You have dominion. Art thou not our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of the land before thy people Israel and give it, gave us it the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? Thou they dwelt therein, built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil come upon us, the sword, pestilence, judgment, pestilence, salmon, famine, we stand before this house in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto the, thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. In the New Testament, you and I can come boldly to the throne of grace. We can pray the word of God. We can take hold of mercy in time of need. We can find grace to help. We can use the authority and stop all the works of the enemy. We can bind, loose, cast down, cast out, speak to mountains, destroy every work of the enemy. You and I have dominion. Well, so we come down to verse 12, and he says, O oh God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company. That's the Old Testament, remember. You and I have authority and might. We can stop the enemies and bring forth destruction. Remember, the battle's the Lord's and the victory's ours, and we put them to operation with our authority. He says, Our eyes are upon thee, and your eyes must be upon the Lord. All Judah stood before the Lord, with their little ones, their wives, and their children. And so upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mataniah, Levite, and the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. As you're seeking God, God will speak to you. He will bring revelation to you. He will show you what the situation is, what you need to be doing. That's why you need to be listening to the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, ready to put His Word in operation. He's ready to perform His Word. And He tells them, He says, Hearken you all, Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thou king of Jehoshaphat. 
He says, Be not afraid nor dismayed by the reason of this great multitude, a great amount of enemies coming against you. The battle's not yours, but God's. You're going to put God in operation. God is going to prevail against those enemies. You cannot be afraid of the devil. You cannot be afraid of sickness and disease. You cannot be afraid of evil things, evil tidings that would come against you. It doesn't matter how many enemies are arrayed against you. And then he began to give them a word of knowledge down here and words of wisdom. He said, tomorrow you'll go down against them. They come up by the cliff of Ziz. You'll find them at the end of the brook. God will show you the plans of the enemy, what the enemy's up to. He'll show you what you need to do as you seek him and you listen unto him. He said, you'll not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand you still, see the salvation of the Lord. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not more in order to be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Make sure that you're not afraid against anything coming against you. You have dominion. You have to get into the fight in the New Testament. We are to fight the good fight of faith. That's how we put him in operation. We are going to war, a good warfare, and we're going to conquer the enemies. And remember, they didn't have not dominion in the Old Testament. They just had to do things in order to put him in operation. So they fell down before the Lord. They're worshiping him. And they begin to praise the Lord, as it says. And he says, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets and you'll prosper. Believe God's word, that he's a performer of it. Believe that you have authority. Believe that you have the power that's available to release against all of your enemies and destroy them. So he consulted with the people and the singers. They pr began to praise the beauty of holiness. They went out before the army, praised the Lord for his mercy endures forever. In the New Testament, the mercies of God are available. They're new every morning. They're available. We just have to come and take hold of them and put them in operation. So they began to sing and praise the Lord. The Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, all these ones, and they were smitten. If you will do what God wants you to do, your enemies will be smitten. Remember, in the New Testament, you are going to put the power of God, the authority, in operation, and you're going to smite all your enemies. It doesn't matter what is coming against you. You're not going to compromise. If you compromise and back down, you're going to be defeated. You must get on the offensive. You must go after them. You must destroy all of them, and you will see God bring forth the promises of God in your life. You must look unto him to fight your battles. We see another situation. This one is over in 2 Kings, in chapter 20. 2 Kings 20, verse 1, In those days Hezekiah was sick unto death. The prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for you're going to die and not live. He turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I've walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Okay, so otherwise he wasn't going to compromise the situation here and just give up and say, okay, that's what he said, so that's it. He's coming to the Lord and saying, this is the way I've lived. It came to pass before Isaiah was gone out in the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, turn again, tell Hezekiah the captain of my people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee, and on the third day thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord. God wants to perform his promises in your life. You bring the word of God unto him and the promises of God, and he will perform it. And he got healed. And what happened? He got 15 more years added. 15 more years were added to his life because he stood on his walk before the Lord and he saw God's mercy and his blessing come forth in his life. God wants you to take hold of the promises of God and see God perform them in your life. We see in Ezra, Ezra chapter 7. Ezra was one who came out of the captivity at Babylon. And in verse 10, it tells you what Ezra did. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. That's what you need to do. You've got to prepare your heart to seek the word and walk in the ways of the word so you will not compromise the things of God. You're going to be a doer of it, and you're going to get it in you such that you can teach others the statutes and the judgments of the Lord. Well, these guys were going to go back to Jerusalem. 
And when they were going back to Jerusalem, they had been speaking to the king how the Lord was the one who was going to protect them and deliver them. Well, in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21, I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahaba. They might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for our substance. You need to seek God for the right way that he has for you. There is a way that you are to walk in. If you will follow his leading in your life, you will walk in that way. You'll be protected. He said, I was ashamed to require the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we'd spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our gods upon all them for good that seek him. Well, they couldn't sit there and all of a sudden go, and they're relying on God's power, and then now they're going to go rely on something in the natural. God wants you to rely on him. Not seek all these natural ways to try to deal with your problems. You seek with the Lord. He said, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath against all them that forsake him. That's right. So we fasted and besought our God for this. Otherwise, I can't ask the king to help me. I've got to trust in the Lord. I've got to believe that God is going to do this. And so they sought God for this, and he was entreated of them. And so as they went, we see the bottom line was, Verse 31, we departed from the river of Baba on the twelfth day of the first month to go into Jerusalem. The hand of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and of such as lay in wait by the way. That shows you the enemies were ready to get to him. God delivered him, though. See, the enemy, remember he goes about seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for ways. If you think he's not going to try to bother you, you're not thinking correctly. The enemy lies in wait to try to get to you. He stalks you, he plans against you, he wants to come against you, he comes, he's walking about seeking whom he may devour. You've got to be on top of things. So they prayed. And so they put the God, God's power, the hand of the Lord was upon them, and he delivered them from the hand of the enemy. God will deliver you from the hand of all your enemies that seek against you, that want to bring destruction against you in your life. But you are going to have to trust in him and seek after the Lord to do what he tells you to do. We also see over in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, we pick up over in verse 27. Here's where Jesus is walking on the water, and they, saw, they thought it was a spirit. And in verse 27, straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it's I, be not afraid. He's walking on the water, and they're all going over, the, going over the other side. Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. He said, come. Now Peter has come down out of the ship. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. That's a supernatural thing. He is walking on the water, following what Jesus had said. But now, now when he, when he saw the wind boisterous, the word boisterous means strong and mighty, he was afraid. Here, a guy's walking on the water. But then what happens? The enemy shows up. Does he continue to have his eyes on Jesus and trusting in him? No. He gets in compromise. He starts moving by being moved by the fear when the enemy comes. Anytime you get moved by the enemy, what he's doing, you have drawn back. You have compromised the word of God. You've gotten your eyes off of Jesus. Here, he got afraid and he began to sink. Of course, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. But notice what he said to him. O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Distazo, which means to stand in two ways. If you're going to walk in victory, you can't stand in two ways. You've got to be set upon the word and know that God will perform his word. You cannot be moved by the attacks of the enemy. When the attacks of the enemy come against you, you need to speak against them. You need to come against them. Not get in fear, not draw back. That's what happened with him. <coughs> he got in fear and he began to sink. And what a big mistake he made. You know, we can't allow that. You get in fear, get in two ways, <coughs> to stazo. In fact, it talks about over in James. The guy who gets in two ways, which is like someone who's double-minded, he's not going to be able to take hold of anything of the Lord. It says so in James 1, 7, Let not that man think that he shall receive, lambano, take hold of anything of the Lord. A double-minded man, this is a two-souled man, he's unstable in all of his ways. 
It's imperative that you not compromise the Word of God by allowing two mindsets to be about you. No, we, cannot, we can't be one way and two, two ways at the same time. We need to be single-minded on the Word, otherwise you won't be able to take hold of anything of the Lord. You won't see God be able to manifest Himself and deliver you and set you free. You need to get locked into the Word of God and do what the Word says. See, we're not going to turn to the right, we're not going to turn to the left, we're not going to turn any way except for walk the way of the Lord. Trust in the Lord and know that He will bring His promises to pass. We see another case where there was pressure coming constantly against this guy. Mark chapter 5, verse 1, when Jesus comes to the Gadarenes country, the Gadarenes, verse 2, he's come out of the ship. Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And this guy was being beat up by the enemy continually. He had his dwelling among the tombs. No man could bind him, no, not with chains. He had supernatural strength from demons operating through him. He'd often bound with fetters and chains. The chains had been plucked asunder by him. Fetters broken in pieces. No man could tame him. This guy was in terrible shape. Always night and day he was in the mountains and the tombs crying, cutting himself with stones. The demons were tormenting him around the clock in everything, every situation. Constant pressure, constant situations against him. Well, you may have some things coming against you. You're, I'm sure you're not in a situation like this guy. But whatever the pressure is, whatever the enemies are bringing against you, what's the answer? You've got to get your eyes on the Lord because He will bring you out of it. You can't compromise and give in and just think this is the way it's going to be for the rest of my life. No. Verse 6. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped Him. You need to come and worship the Lord. You need to put Him first place in your life. You need to realize that He is your total source. He came and began to worship Him. What's going to be the response when you begin to worship the Lord? Well, the Lord is going to start casting out the demons. What happened? Cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. That's the demons speaking. And why was He speaking? Because for... He said, and this is in an imperfect tense verb, which is translated, for he was saying unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Otherwise, he comes and worships him. Jesus begins to cast the demon out of him. The demon is speaking back, trying to, of course, if he's afraid where he's going to be tormented, he, didn't, you know, he didn't, wants to know if he's going to send him to a, some place to be tormented. Well, Jesus was casting the demons out of this guy. What's the answer? Get the demons cast out and continue to cast them out until they're all gone. This guy wasn't going to put up with the devils anymore once he found out who Jesus was. And he comes and worships him and submits to him and allows him to start casting the demons. In the New Testament, of course, you and I have authority, and we're to cast the demons out of us. Down in verse 15, what was the result? They come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil, and he had the legion. He had this tremendous number of demons. 6,826 men was a legion. All these demons sitting, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. This guy got set free. And what did, of course, he wanted to follow after Jesus. And down in verse 18, verse 19, Jesus suffered him not, or verse 18, when he came in the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed that he might be with him. He wanted to be with Jesus. But Jesus instead wanted him to go and tell everybody because they all were rejecting this. They were all Baal worshipers, Canaanites in this area. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends. Tell them how great the things the Lord hath done for thee and hath compassion on thee. He departed, and he just didn't go into one city. He began to publish in Decapolis. That's the ten cities that were all around that whole area. I mean, he went everywhere telling them. And these are the guys that were all the Baal worshippers that rejected and told Jesus to get out of there. See, there was certainly, this guy had tremendous pressure coming against him, he came to Jesus, he got, the, got delivered. Well, he's now going to go. And the more pressure was going to come against him, certainly from the testimony that he was bringing forth. But you know what? He wasn't going to back off. God wants you to get delivered, and he also wants you to testify of the things that he has done. There will be pressure. 
There will be attacks when you give testimony of the work of God being accomplished in your life. But you cannot compromise. You cannot compromise. You are to be a bold witness for the Lord. He talked about how great things Jesus had done for him and all the men did marvel. And they couldn't, they had, what could they say? This is the guy that was the crazy guy. Everybody knew about this guy. And yet now he was set free. God wants you to get your eyes on the Lord and know that he will bring you out of bondage and he will set you free. And then you're going to testify to others. Otherwise, you don't just get delivered and then hold, hold it all in yourself. You need to testify to others. Mark chapter 5, verse 22. Here's one of the rulers of the synagogue. His name was Jairus that comes to Jesus, fell at his feet. And he's got a tremendous evil situation, tremendous pressure coming against him because his daughter is at the point of death. He says, my little daughter, she lies at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her. She may be healed and she shall live. Jesus went with him. He's on the way. Well, we come down to verse 35. While he had spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why trouble thou the master any further? Well, she was at the point of death. Now she dies. It looks like it's all over. He could just throw in the towel and give up, compromise what he was believing and looking for that Jesus would come and raise her up, heal her, and set her free. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, anything that tries to hinder you from the promise being realized in your life because of circumstances changing or whatever, well, you've got to listen because God's going to speak to you. He said in the rule of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Don't throw in the towel. You believe. You believe the word of God. You cannot be afraid. In the midst of that attack that comes against you, you cannot compromise and back off, regardless of what the situation is. Be not afraid, only believe. And so he, he followed. He continued on. He didn't throw in the towel. He didn't allow that temptation. Why trouble the master any further to get a hold of him where he'd give up? And so he goes on, and they come in here, and he, Jesus says, why, why make this ado and weep? You know, she's dead. He knew she was dead from the standpoint. The damsel's not dead, but sleep. Otherwise, he wasn't even going to even confess what the enemy had accomplished. accomplished. <clears throat> they laughed him to scorn. When he put them all out, he took the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him entered in where the damsel was lying, took the damsel by the hand, and said unto her, Talitha Kumai, which be interpreted damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked. And she was at the age of 12 years. They were astonished with a great astonishment. Raising the dead. The Bible talks about heal the sick, cast out the demons, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Freely you receive, freely give. You and I have authority and dominion over the works of the enemy. He could have thrown in the towel. The pressure was there. And then the word came. He could have given up. The pressure was coming at him in his mind. And yet, be not afraid, only believe, continue on. And he saw the victory came forth. Never throw in the towel. You have a promise from God, you go to possess that promise in your life. Regardless of what circumstances come against you, you must continue in faith. Otherwise, you won't see God accomplish what he purposes. In Matthew, or Luke chapter 5, we see another situation. Verse 17. It came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. God's presence was the power of the Lord. Jesus was healing people all over the place. Well, they couldn't get in. So what are they going to do? Yeah, they're not going to be denied. Their faith is, we're going to get this done somehow. Behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in, to lay him before him, and they couldn't find by what way they could bring him in because of the multitude. So they went upon the housetop, let him down through the tiling and his couch into the midst before Jesus, began to take the tiling off the roof to get him into there. They weren't, they weren't going to let anything stop them. They're gonna, we're going to get to Jesus one way or the other. You've got to have that kind of faith. You're not going to be denied from anything. You're going to get to him. Verse 20, when they saw their faith, he said, Man, thy sins are forgiven. 
This means to send, being sent away. They were sent away from in the Old Testament era. Of course, they got all met, sent out, bent out of shape. Who can send away sins but God alone, these guys said. Jesus perceived their thoughts. He said, what reason you in your hearts? Which is easier to say, thy sins be sent away from you, or say, rise up and walk. But you may know that the Son of Man has authority, it's the word exousia, upon earth to send away sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And of course, immediately he rose up before him and took off up that whereupon he lay, and he parted to his own house, glorifying God. The pressure was there, it looked like there's no way I can get in. It didn't matter, this guy's going to get in in some way or the other. Jesus sees this guy's in faith. All the rest of the guys, the doctors of the law, they weren't in faith. They were all a bunch of judges and being negative. And so he comes and what happens? He, he sees his faith. Jesus always responds to faith. He will respond to your faith. He dealt with the thing, remitting the sins. In the New Testament, we can confess our sins. We forgive those people that have hurt us or wronged us. You have to always forgive, remember. You remit the sins and iniquities of the forefathers if it's inherited generational. And then begin to take hold of the promise, cast out the demons, or take hold of the healing power. And that's exactly what happened. This guy, these guys would not be denied. Their faith brought forth victory. And you see continually, Jesus would say, your faith has made you whole. Be it unto you according to your faith. According to your faith, be it unto you. Your faith will make you whole. Do not ever back down on your faith. Your faith will bring the victory in your life, praise God. And they were all amazed and glorified God, filled with fear, saying, we've seen strange things this day, <laughs> incredible things. They were just dazzled. We see another situation. This is involving Peter. Sometimes Peter was doing good. Sometimes he wasn't doing so good, as you will see. Sometimes he would compromise. He had a problem with compromising. Matthew chapter 26, verse 34. Jesus said to him, I say unto thee, that this night before the cock throws, you're going to deny me three times. <laughs> of course, that's exactly what happened. He did deny him three times. Of course, his answer was, Peter said to him, though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. A oh, nice, good confession sounded like, but Jesus told him the truth. Likewise also said all the disciples that they wouldn't do this, or what happened. We come down to verse 69. Peter sat without the palace, and a damsel said to him, saying, Thou wast also with Jesus of Galilee. And he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. He refused to acknowledge that. When he was gone out in the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. Again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. After a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art also also art one of them, for thy speech be thee. And then he began to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew, crew because of the third time that it had happened. Peter denied the Lord. He compromised the word of God. He still had this problem even when he was dealing there with, there in Jerusalem. After the time of things that got, he got, in, you know, he was the leader of the church there. And Paul comes to Antioch in Galatians chapter 2 because he hears what's going on here. <clears throat> when Peter, Peter was come to Antioch, I stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. What was going on? For before that, certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. He was a compromiser. The other Jews dissembled or were hypocritical acting hypocritical, that means, likewise with him. Insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away. He was being affected by their dissimulation, or this means hypocrisy. Now, if someone's doing that, what's he, you got to do? You've got to deal with this thing publicly right there on the spot. You can't compromise and just kind of let it slide. Oh, here we're dealing with Peter, you know, one of the pillars and so forth of the church, one of the disciples. When I saw they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, right there in front of them all publicly. He didn't take them aside. He had to deal with it because 
If he's doing this in front of everybody, it's got to be dealt with in front of everybody. I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles, and do not as the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Hey, he's confronting them all this. And so he comes down to verse 18. He says, If I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If you're going to go back into the ways of the law, you're making yourself, the things that we got rid of and destroyed, you're making yourself a transgressor, a sinner yourself. I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. He called them on the carpet because he was in compromise, acting one way with the Gentiles and acting any one way with the ones that were the ones from Jerusalem that were, had been born again, but were circumcised, you know, the ones under the, the Old Testament, the Jews. We cannot compromise things. We better be sure we act the same all the time. We can't act, act one way around one group and one way around another group. Oh, they like this way, so I'll do this, and they'll all be over differently over here. No. You, can't, you must walk the walk and be walking in obedience to God's Word with no compromise in any situation. We cannot be hypocrites whatsoever. So he had some problems. At the same time, though, he did a lot of good things. We see over in Acts chapter 5. <clears throat> Acts chapter 5, we come down to verse 18. Here's where the persecution came against them <clears throat> because they were preaching the gospel. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, brought them forth. And he said, go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. You know, you might think, oh, get, all, get away, you can get out of town now, everything will be fine. No. <laughs> He says, go and continue to speak the word right there, you know. Hey, if he delivered you once from these guys throwing you in the jail, he could deliver you again. He says, go and speak. Otherwise, you're not going to go and hide. You're going to continue to preach the gospel. You're going to be bold in this situation. So, they heard that. They entered the temple early in the morning and taught. High priest came. They that were with him called the council together. All the senate of the children of Israel sent to the prison to have them brought. When the officers came, found him not in the prison, they returned and told him, saying, The prison truly is found, we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors, but when we opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain, the chief, and chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them wherein this would grow. And the one came and said, Behold, the men whom you put in prison, they're standing in the temple, and they're teaching the people. These guys could not compromise, remember. They're to preach the gospel. When God delivers you, he wants you to continue on in the things of God. We are not to be afraid. We are not to compromise the word or the calling of God upon our life. So they went with the captain, with the officers, brought up them without violence. They feared the people. And so then they bring them in. They set them before the council. And the high priest, high priest asked them, Did not we straightly command you you should not teach in this name? And behold, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. What's their response? Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought, which really means to must. It's a word die. We must obey God rather than men. It is necessary by as binding. We must obey the Lord. He did not compromise. He did the right thing. God does not want us to compromise the preaching of the gospel. We need to stand up for what's right. We cannot deny him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. We need to stand up and preach the gospel and go forth and obey God rather than men. doesn't matter what comes down the line. You're going to preach the gospel. You're going to do the things that God says. You're not going to fall for any of this political correctness stuff or, or religious correctness or whatever they might call it. No, you're going to serve the Lord. You're going to carry out the things of the Lord. We cannot be in compromise. Too many Christians have been in compromise and they aren't preaching the gospel. They're in fear. Fear a man. Fear what people will say. That's a big mistake. We have got to be those that are going to go forth and preach the gospel. We see also over in Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, it speaks about Stephen. Stephen was one who, in the midst of the pressure that would come against him, he didn't bow. He, he wasn't going to compromise whatsoever. He was going to go preach the gospel. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 5, it speaks about him. 
where they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost and all these other ones to handle the situation where the, the widows were being neglected in the daily administration. And we come down to verse 8. Stephen, not only was he, as it says back here, full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, he was also full of faith and power and did wonders and miracles among the people. God wants you and I to get full of faith and full of power and go forth and do the mighty works of the Lord, casting out demons as miraculous works, healing the sick, doing the mighty works of the Lord. He went forth and did these great things. There arose certain of the synagogue, which called the synagogue Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and those of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. They were coming against him. He had a lot. You know, when he said people are doing these things, they're going to come, people are going to come against you. And that's exactly what they did. And they began to bring persecution against him. Well, Stephen finally stood up and he began to preach the gospel to these guys. And as he was preaching the gospel to them, they got so upset. And he comes down to verse chapter 7, verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Hey, he held nothing back. He told it like it was. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? You've slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, by whom you've now been now the betrayers and murderers. I mean, he's not hold, mincing words. He's not holding anything back, is he? You, you who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. He's calling them on the carpet on everything. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. He, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly in the heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Well, Jesus was seated at the right hand of the Father. What's he doing standing? He stood up because he was honoring him, because this guy was totally uncompromised, he was totally sold out to do the work of God, full of faith, full of power, full, full of the Holy Ghost, went forth and did all these miraculous works, sharing the gospel to, with them. Jesus approved him to the utmost, standing on the right hand of heaven. He had a, a vision, uh, things opened up, up, heaven opened up. He said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Saul was right there witnessing the whole deal. They stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice and said, Lord, lay not the sin to their charge. I mean, he followed the Lord 100%. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This guy got martyred. Mm -hmm. But who carried on the mantle? Paul. Paul's the one who got reached. And Paul's the one who then went on and carried on this throughout the New Testament. Paul operated powerfully. We see over in Acts chapter 9, <clears throat> Paul was an uncompromising person. You know, he was so zealous. He's going after the Christians. He gets the letters, you know, from the high priest to go to Damascus to find all these Christians, to lock them up. He was as zealous, as zealous as anybody. And so he's breathing out his threatenings and slaughter against the disciples and going there. But on the way, what happens? This is where the Lord manifests himself. And, of course, he ends up getting born again. And the Lord says to him, says to him when he says, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said, Arise, and go into the city, and it will be told you what you must do. So he goes in there, and here he comes in. He's go three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. A certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias, to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. God wants us to be real disciples. Remember, real disciples are the ones that are bringing forth fruit, more fruit, and much fruit, and they're following the Lord. They're obedient to him. They're continuing in the word. This guy hears from the Lord. God manifests himself to him in a vision. God wants us to be this way so God could reach you at a point in time to bring something to you. He says, Behold, I'm here, Lord. The Lord said, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight. <clears throat> Gives him a word of knowledge. Inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. Gives him a word of knowledge where he is and a word of wisdom of what he's doing when he gets there. 
that he's praying. He's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and put his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Now Ananias answered and said, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he's done to the saints at Jerusalem. He wasn't in doubt. He wasn't even resistant. He just wants to find out the facts of what, what you know, this, this, this report, what's the status of this situ with this guy. He has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. The Lord said, Go thy way as the chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. He had to obey. He couldn't compromise. He couldn't draw back in fear. He couldn't say, Get somebody else. I don't want to deal with this guy. No, he's going to obey. He's not going to compromise. God wants you to be ready to obey whatever the Lord tells you to do. When he tells you to do something, there's going to be a reason why he wants you to do it. He says, go your way, because this guy's going to bear the name before the Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. And I'll show him how much great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Ananias went his way and entered the house, putting his hands on him, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, <clears throat> that appeared unto thee in the way that thou camest, he'd revealed to him all those things, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. That was for the purpose of the ministry that he was going to be carrying forth. That shows you. This is a guy is hearing from the Lord. God wants us to be so uncompromised that we're so filled up with the things of God. God can speak to you and use you to reach people. Every one of us. We can be used of the Lord for God to bring the Holy Spirit, bringing revelation to us, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, speak to you, give you a vision, whatever it might be, to direct you. Immediately there fell from the eyes that had been scales. He received a sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And then he begins to go forth with the disciples who were at Damascus. Well, Paul got raised up to be mighty. He was not one that would compromise whatsoever. And after he was there, gr growing up in all these things, and was a teacher in the church, he comes to the place where he begins to go forth. This is a guy who was uncompromised. This is a guy who would obey whatever God told him to do. This is the kind of Christians that God's going to raise up. The remnant who are going to be strong, mighty, do the will of God. We're not going to be closet Christians. We're going to be bold. We're going to go forth and do what the works of the Lord mightily. There's going to be great and mighty works be done. It, how's it going to come? It's going to come through the church, you and me, that are going to be available, make ourselves available to do these things. Acts chapter 13, verse 6. They'd gone through the isle into Paphos. They found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew. His name was Bar-Jesus. He's with a deputy of the country. Now he's got a chance to talk to the deputy of the country, like a vice president of the country. Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul, desired to hear the word of God. Elimus the sorcerer, so as his name is by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Now we've got a confrontation. The gospel will bring confrontation. It is confrontational. And so you can't compromise in the midst of confrontation and back off. No. What's he do? Saul, who's also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. Now why was he filled with the Holy Spirit? He was doing things that caused that. Remember, what's the filling of the Holy Spirit? That's the filling of the Holy Spirit that comes from praise, worship, praying in tongues, so that you are for the influence of the Holy Spirit, for the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life. This has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in you. That's receiving the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is the being filled with the Holy Spirit to manifest Him for the service of the Lord. And that's what happened. So you've got to get filled with the Holy Spirit if you're going to be ready for God to manifest Himself through you. Paul was. He's ready. He sets his eyes on Him. He said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? He speaks it clear. He tells him straight out, confronting this guy that's a sorcerer. You can't be afraid of anybody. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Dealt with that guy. He didn't compromise. He didn't draw back. He dealt with the situation. You've got to be ready to confront the enemies that are at work to try to hinder things. So, the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. You know, God's the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
And he's going to move mightily in the last day's church. Remember, what happened in the book of Acts is going to happen again in the end time church. It's going to be a replay because the same things are going to happen. The glory of God was on the early church. It's going to be a double portion on the end time church because the glory will be greater than it was on the early church. Astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. This guy did not compromise. He did not back off. He dealt with the thing successfully. You've got to come. You need to start confronting anything that would come against you, regardless of what it is. You may not be at this stage, but you need to start confronting the enemy and not giving place to him in any area of your life. We see another situation that happened. <clears throat> Acts 16, verse 16 came to pass, we went to prayer. So here he's praying, we're just having a prayer, time of prayer. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us. Oh, the devil shows up with someone. The devil will try to show up to try to hinder you and block you, attack you, different things. Which brought our masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God. The King James says, Which show unto us the way of salvation. It's a mistake in the Greek, a mistake in the King James, because in the Greek, the word the, when it's in there, is a, there's a definite article that's translated, that's shown in the Greek, that's translated the. There is no definite article here. This is why Young's corrects the error, and it's translated a way of salvation, not the, a way of salvation. So what was she doing? She was saying, these are servants of the Most High God who's declaring to us a way of salvation. Well, what does that imply? Well, there's many different ways of salvation. Well, you've got to confront that. What do we see happening today? It's the same thing in the modern day. There's many ways to God, you know. It's a lie. You've got to be ready to confront that. There is not many ways. There is not a way and this way and that way of salvation. There's only one way, the way of salvation. It is through Jesus Christ. Well, what's he going to do? Is he going to compromise and just kind of let this thing slide? No. This she did many days. Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Now, is he getting her delivered from all the demons to set her free from bondages? No. He's coming against the demon that's driving her to be used of the devil for the devil's works the devil's ministry operating through her. He's throwing this thing out her to stop the devil's works. He's confronting that. Confronting just like confronting a witch or confronting a sorcerer or confronting a, someone that's got a spirit of divination operating through them. I command thee in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he's commanding. He's not saying it just once. The word command is in the present tense. He was continually commanding this thing to come out of her in the name of Jesus. And it came out the same hour. Apparently he had a battle. He just didn't speak once. He said he knew what he was doing. You've got to know what you're doing. That's why you've got to prove all the things of God in your own life. Remember, David, he proved it with a lion and a bear before he dealt with a Goliath. You need to be proving it in your own life and conquering the enemies so you'll be ready for whatever kind of giant might come at you. In this case, he cast that thing out continually until it came out, and it came out that hour. He destroyed the works of the enemy. That means you and I could be used to destroy devils operating demonic ministries through people. Destroy them. That's what God wants. He wants us to destroy the, the kingdom of darkness works through all these evil spirits operating, whether they're in the heavenlies or operating through people. You and I have dominion. And that the church that's going to have the glory of God is going to be holy. It's going to destroy the works of the enemy to see people being saved. Tremendous move of the Spirit of God is going to happen in these last days. Well, what happened from this? Well, they didn't let this go by idly. They saw our, the masters saw the hope of their gains was gone. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them in the marketplace under the rulers. Here they had the pressure of dealing with that. Now they got more pressure coming against them. Now they can't compromise. They brought him to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. They teach customs are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. The multitude rose up together against them. The magistrates rent their clothes and commanded to beat them. 
They made, laid many stripes upon him, cast him in the prison, and charging the, the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them in the inner prison, made their feet fast in the stocks. It looks like now they're in trouble. Everything's kind of coming to a halt. No, it doesn't matter what happens. God has got a call of God upon their lives. He's got a call on your lives. At midnight, which would speak of the darkest hour from a natural standpoint, what'd they do? They didn't cry, lament, get down and depressed, compromise and draw back. No, their eyes are on the Lord. They're going to stay in the spirit. They're going to watch God move. Look at all the things he'd already done. They're going to watch God move in this situation. They prayed, sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So they weren't doing it under their breath in the corner. They're doing everybody's hearing. Hey, these guys are having a praise and worship and having prayer. They're praying and interceding. They also are preaching the gospel, as you'll see. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. I mean, these guys had the pressure coming against them of being thrown in jail. Think of all the attacks coming against your mind in that situation. You know, all the things that the devil's thoughts would have been thrown at you. It's all over, you're done, and all this stuff. No, immediately all the doors were open, every man's bands were loosed. The keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword. He would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had fled. <coughs> but Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm. We're all here. They didn't get up and leave. They just were going to watch what God wanted to do. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. And why is he doing that? Because they had been preaching the gospel to him. And now they knew the God's power came in operation to open this thing up. They brought him out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How did they know about that? Because he was preaching the gospel. These guys were praying, singing praises, preaching the gospel. They weren't backing off. They weren't in compromise. These guys weren't drawing back. They were aggressive as ever. They were doing what the Lord wanted them to do. And of course, he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved in thy house. Spake to him the word of God and all that were in his house. Took him the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, baptized he in all his straightway. Brought him into the house, set meat before them, rejoiced, believing in God with all their house. So here, they, then when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant saying, let those men go. What happened? They took him back in the jail. They didn't leave him out. They were back in the jail. Keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go, now therefore depart and go in peace. You think, oh, okay, everything's fine. No, they weren't going to even let this go. They say, oh, these guys are just trying to get this out because they want them to depart and go in peace. Look what he said. Paul said to them, they've beaten us, openly condemned, uncondemned, being Romans, we're appealing to be as Romans, they cast us in the prison, and now do they thrust us out privily. Privily means secretly. Otherwise, they're trying to just cover over what they just did to us and secretly get away with us. Oh, they're not going to do this. They're going to make things done right. I mean, that's a guy that's uncompromised. Nay, barely, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. <laughs> We're going to make these guys, they're not going to secretly get out of this. They're going to have to come and get us out and do it the right way. I mean, this guy, he was uncompromised. He didn't, wasn't just going to, oh boy, let's get out of here and run away. No. He's going to do what's right. Sergeant told the words on the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. Came and besought them and brought them out, desired them to depart out of the city. So they got them out. Here, these guys were tough. They were strong. They were dealing with any situation that came against them. We come down to Acts chapter 19. Now, it came to pass that while Apollo was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples. And he says to them, of course, what should you be saying when you find disciples? Don't just say, oh, I'm glad you're a Christian, born again, and that's it. Well, suppose they don't have the Holy Spirit yet. Well, you need to find out and spiritually locate people. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? <laughs> Otherwise, he's here to minister. You and I are ministers for the Lord, and we cannot compromise and draw back. We all have a ministry. We're supposed to help people get born again. We're supposed to cast out demons. We're supposed to heal the sick. We're supposed to help people receive the Holy Spirit. Every one of us. God wants you to be, have such a boldness upon you. 
I mean, Paul would say, pray for me that I have boldness to go and preach the gospel as I ought or as I must. He knew that. He said, I've got to have this boldness so I go and carry these things out. I can't be in compromise and get back in fear or go back in, in the flesh or do whatever I think I should do. No, I've got to keep doing what the Lord wants me to do. This is the kind of church that's going to be raised up in the last days. They don't compromise for nothing. So, they said, we didn't need so much as to even hear there was any Holy Ghost. They didn't even know anything about it. Well, it turned out down in verse 6 that Paul laid his hands upon them. The Holy Ghost came on them. They spake with tongues and they prophesied. And then all the men were about 12 there. They went in the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing, persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. He just went right into where all these guys were hating him, right in the synagogue, and disputing and persuading the word of God. Otherwise, he was not. He was ready to confront them. He wasn't going to compromise and draw back and live one of these nice little easy lives. No. He's going to go and he's going to confront these guys. When divers were hardened and believed not, spake evil of that way before the multitude. See, the gospel's confrontational. We have to come out of all fears. We've got to come out of everything that would hinder us from wanting to be willing to confront things. We've got to have wisdom and know how to do things Make do things right. He had the wisdom to do things. Spake evil of that way before the multitude. He departed from them, separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And what happened from this? He's following the way of the Lord. This continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. This guy is reaching and here. He was following the Holy Spirit. One time he wanted to go into that way, but God told him, no, you're not going to go here yet. You've got to go over to Macedonia. You remember, to get a vision of where he was to go. You want to be led by the Holy Spirit instead of going where he wanted. But the end result was all Asia heard because this is the way of the Lord. God wants you led by the Holy Spirit. He wants you to be bold. You've got to be ready to go. You've got to be ready to obey. You're not going to be led by the Holy Spirit if you're not going to be in that frame of mind ready to do the things he wants. If we have this least bit of compromise, it's not going to happen. I mean, when he came to Ananias, he, you know, he didn't pick somebody that, well, I don't know if this guy's going to listen to me and, and you know, be afraid of Saul or not. No. This guy, I know what he's going to do. This guy's already proven himself. This guy's a disciple. He's following the way of the Lord. This guy continues in the Word and obeys. He does what I want. I know he's going to listen to me. And he asked, asked the question, what about this guy who's been, you know, he's sent to... Bring, put the Christians in prison, he just answers the question, tells them what to do, gives them words of knowledge. This guy was tuned into the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants. He wants to raise you up, and as you get rid of all the compromise in your life, and you get totally tuned in to the Word and listening to the Holy Spirit, He will use you and me mightily. But we do have to come out of all compromise. You know, can he, are we going to be faithful? Can He count on you? Can he know you're going to do things? Can he know you're going to hear and you're going to obey what he tells you to do? That is the type of militant, mighty, powerful church led by the Holy Spirit that is going to be raised up in these last days. What a mighty church. Paul was mighty. Of course, you know, well, what happened? He got all this revelation. He wrote most all the New Testament. I mean, this guy was 100% on, on everything. He did tremendous things. He had attacks. He had his eye thing coming against him. He had to grow in things. There were times when he didn't know what to do. You know, he's asking the Lord to get rid of this thorn in the flesh from the devil's evil spirit sent at him three times. And God says that my grace is sufficient, which means it gives you the means to defend and ward off the enemy. Otherwise, he had to learn how to do these things. But Paul was one who grew up in all this and he walked in power and authority, and he saw God use him mightily. Every one of us has to grow, so we're going to grow up. He wants you to get to the place of being uncompromised in everything that you do. One last scripture. This is regarding those who were wise to make sure that what they were hearing was the right thing. Acts, chapter 17, that is. In Acts chapter 17, we pick up in verse 10. The brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither, thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. 
These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. God wants you to be one who is going to search the scriptures before you receive things. Well, we got all this false doctrine. If all the Christians were really were in the scriptures and studying the scriptures and checking them out the way they should, instead of receiving all these false doctrines, we wouldn't have the big mess in the body of Christ today. They'd stand up and say, nope, that's not of the Lord. I'm not going to receive that. It's not true. Where's that in the Bible? It's not in the Bible, all this kind of stuff that people say. No, with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures, whether the things be so. God wants us to be people of the word and are going to know the truth. We see that we cannot have compromise. If we have compromise in the midst of pressure, we'll go nowhere. Just think of all what happened to these guys. Elijah, Elisha, Jehoshaphat, all these ones in the midst of pressure, situations that came against them, whatever it might be. They, they did the right thing. They made the right choices. The pressure to not go forth to get delivered or not to go forth and, and, and the, the, your daughter's dead, give up. No, the pressure's coming against the mind. You have to know, just like you get attacked against your mind, the pressures will be there. You cannot compromise. You've got to know what the Word says and believe what the Word says and follow the Word of God, knowing that God will bring the victory. A faith that will not be denied, not compromising whatsoever. You know, God's no respecter of persons. What he's done for one, he'll do for all. Your faith will make you whole. Your faith will deliver you. He will use you boldly to preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit's on the inside of you. If you'll learn to listen to the Holy Spirit, follow his leading, follow the word, he'll start bringing things forth in your life. The gifts of the Holy Spirit want to rise up, come up forth out of your life as you're going forth. But you're going to have to have, be ready to do what he says. Be confident. What's the, going to be the key? No compromise. It's going to be a step-by-step -step process. God wants all the compromise out of all of our lives so that we are going to do what he says. We're not going to draw back. And not remember, all excuses are compromise. We don't have any excuses. We're going to do what he says. And we are going to grow up and we're going to become strong and mighty for the Lord. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for all these ones who in the midst of pressure situations, they did not compromise. They went forth and did what the Word said, obeyed the leading of the Holy Spirit, did the mighty works of the Lord. They knew the Lord because they walked in His ways and they obeyed what He told them to do. They did not draw back. They did not compromise. And they became strong and mighty and were used mightily of the Lord. I thank you. I am eliminating all compromise in my life. So in the midst of pressure, I will not succumb to it, but I will do what God wants. And the enemies will be conquered. The works of God will be done. What God wants me to accomplish will get done. Enemies will be confronted and driven out. The gospel will be preached. And God will use me mightily to accomplish what he wants. I thank you. I'm not compromising in anything in my life. No fears, no drawing back, no being dismayed. I am sold out to follow the Lord and to obey Him in every situation. Thank you, Lord. I am making that decision this night. I'm going to grow up in all areas. I'm going to get full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, full of power. Be ready to do what the Lord wants me to do. Thank you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit manifest in my life. And thank you. I'll be a disciple ready to obey. Do whatever you want me to do. Ready to follow your ways. Ready to confront devils. Ready to destroy the works of the enemy. I thank you. As I grow in all these areas, and I become strong, and you can count on me 
I show I'm faithful, you will use me mightily in these last days. I thank you, Lord. No compromise in the midst of any pressure coming against me in my life from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. You may say, well, I'm not there like these guys yet. But you know, it's step by step growth, it's step by step increase, it's step by step. You get stronger and stronger and stronger. You get this kind of commitment and start going forth, you're going to start coming. You're going to rise up and you're going to get to that place where God is going to use you more and more and more. People say, I wonder why God's not doing all these things like this. Because the people haven't come to this place. I mean, look at this guy. He's totally uncompromised. He's totally ready to confront anything and everything. He's not going to back down to anything. I mean, this guy is so zealous, talking about Paul. And Stephen was so zealous. God, Jesus is standing up when he's getting martyred. I mean, this is a guy who, hey, he followed him to a T. And then that mantle went right on over to Paul after he got converted, and he carried it on out. Well, God's going to do mighty things in the end-time church, and he wants to use you and me. Things will be exciting. The pressure will be there, but we're going to overcome, and we're not going to succumb to it, because we will not compromise. God will perform his word and his promises in your life. Work out your own salvation. Watch God work mightily in you. Father, we thank you for all you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of your word. We thank you that we will not compromise and we will overcome all situations, pressures, anything the enemy brings against us. And we will see you accomplish everything in our life and work through us mightily in these days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God.